Today there was chaos at the city hospital. Monica, the wife of a prominent businessman, was being transferred to a private clinic. The initiator himself, Monica's husband Thomas, was nowhere to be seen beside the patient, who had been in a coma for the past two weeks. Why are they moving Monica from the ICU, puzzled the intensivist, Miguel. We have orders from above, better not interfere, said the specialists from the private clinic handling Monica's transportation. Does her husband even know what's going on here? The doctor protested. It might harm her. And why isn't he here at such a moment? Miguel lamented. It was Thomas himself who insisted on transferring his wife to us. Here are all the documents, replied the private clinic medics. He's not with us because he's a busy man. Our job is to transport the patient and connect her to life support. Yours is to hand over the accompanying documents and assist us. And what difference does it make if her husband is here or not? Everything is paid for, they explained. Miguel stood there, hands down, astonished by the human indifference and greed. They were dragging his patient, whom he had invested so much time and effort in, out of danger, as if she were a stray dog to some unknown place. He had given her husband decent prognosis. And now, as they shook her and switched her from one machine to another, it was uncertain how her body might react. He stopped the gurney on which Monica lay, adjusted the blanket, checking her vital signs. When they took the patient away, Miguel found Thomas's phone number and called him. Hello, this is your wife's attending physician. Why are you transferring her to another clinic? And you didn't inform me, although you know very well that it will harm her. Do you not trust our hospital because it's free? Or you're not satisfied with me as her doctor? You know what, Dr. McGill, this is my personal affair and none of your business, arrogantly replied Thomas to the person who brought his wife back from the brink. I go wherever I want. I'm busy, I can't talk right now. Goodbye. And Thomas thought to himself, What a nosy doctor. You treated my wife too well. That's why I'm transferring her. Thomas was indeed busy. He was enjoying his time with another fling. You see, in his circles, he was considered quite the ladies' man. As the saying goes, he wouldn't let a single skirt pass by. And now, this new skirt named Veronica, a 22-year-old girl, completely captured the attention of the suave businessman as she considered Thomas to be. But in reality, the real suave one was Monica, who built her husband's empire from scratch. They married when they were still in college. Even back then, Monica, a brilliant economist, dreamed of running her own company. Gathering a team of equally talented young people like herself, Monica achieved her goal and became an influential businesswoman. And her husband Thomas was just a compliment to her success but not to offend her clueless spouse, who knew nothing about business, Monica made it seem like he was her assistant and right-hand man. But everyone knew that Thomas couldn't even handle the basics. Monica even built their country house herself, without her husband's help, who was always flying high in the clouds and enjoying late-night parties. Monica found the builder, supervised the construction progress, regularly visited the site near the pine forest and a small river, so reminiscent of her hometown. But Monica fell ill. Suddenly, she just collapsed at work. Initially, doctors thought the woman had exhausted herself with work or had been poisoned by competitors. But the problem was much deeper. Monica silently developed an unpleasant and dangerous illness inherited from her grandmother on her mother's side. The disease crept up on her unnoticed, just as Monica was on the verge of taking her company to an international level. Not at all opportune. However, illness is never timely, it's frustrating. Yet, the new partners saw tremendous potential in her and promised to wait for her recovery. But it never came. 
and now Monica had been in a coma for over a week. Thomas tried to negotiate with the new business partners, but they quickly realized that he was just a mediocre guy, of which there are plenty in business. Why don't you sell the company off in pieces? It'll be more profitable, said the sweet Veronica. We'll get the money, move abroad, somewhere warm, by the sea. We'll buy a little house there, hire some help, and just enjoy life. Yeah. And what about Monica? What do you plan to do with her? Think before you speak, grumbled Thomas discontentedly. The company is registered in her name. It will only pass to me in the event of the owner's death. That's how it's stipulated in the company's bylaws, explained Veronica. So just disconnect her from life support, Veronica stated matter-of-factly, as if discussing a fly. Why keep torturing her and yourself? You have the right to do it, she continued. And what am I supposed to tell her parents? Thomas asked his mistress. Do you know her father? He's quite a tough guy, even though he's from the countryside. He won't hesitate to throw fists. And her mom, she's quite the scandal maker too. Didn't want Monica to marry me, saying, why does she need such a freeloader? My mother-in-law thinks I'm too handsome and I use my charms on women. According to her, I should work like a dog and smell like one too. Can you imagine if these relatives show up here? That's why I haven't told them anything about my wife's condition. Veronica fell silent and pouted. She was eager to get rid of her rival and fully capture Thomas's heart. And, of course, his money, of which she imagined there was plenty. The next morning, as Thomas and Veronica were having breakfast, entertaining each other with gossip about mutual acquaintances, Monica's new attending physician called Thomas. Hello, Thomas, said a brisk male voice. This is the doctor, the intensivist from the clinic. I have an unusual proposal for you. For the successful recovery of your wife from the coma and the restoration of her cognitive functions, I ask you to be present in the intensive care unit more often and talk to her more. Do you understand what I'm saying? Why should I talk to someone who hasn't reacted to anything in ages? It's a waste of time. Frankly, you surprised me, Thomas replied unhappily. No, you're wrong. Patients in such a state can hear everything perfectly well, but they need help, the doctor tried to convince Thomas. She needs your help specifically. The help of a loved one, understand? Fine, I'll think about it, Thomas said dryly and hung up. Veronica sat at the table absent-mindedly scrolling through her phone. Seeing her lover's upset expression, she asked, Who called? Oh, it's the doctors from the clinic, pestering me even here, for what I pay them, Thomas replied. They think I'm dying to sit by a vegetable and babble stories to her. I have nothing else to do. She's going to die soon anyway, and all efforts will be in vain. And I don't want to go to her. I don't like all these hospital walls, the horrifying sight of my wife. And you don't have to go, suggested Veronica. Let's send someone else in your place. They haven't seen you in person, right? Just hire some fool. Let him sit there and tell her fairy tales. Pay him a little. He'll be happy. Problem solved. Thomas's expensive car raced down the highway towards the city, ignoring speed limits. He was rushing to lavish Veronica with his grace in the form of luxurious trinkets. But as he approached the bridge leading to the jewelry store, a tire on the car burst. Damn it! Thomas got out of the car and helplessly inspected the deflated tire. Then he glanced at his neatly manicured nails. What bad luck. Need a hand? A young man approached Thomas. He disdainfully glanced at him and stepped back a couple of steps, as if from a flea-ridden dog. The young man looked like either a vagabond or some kind of street artist. 
He was dressed fairly neatly, but very modestly. Intelligence shone in his eyes, and there were kind sparks in them. Here, the tires blown, Thomas complained. Can you replace it? I'll pay. I'm in a hurry, want to get a gift for my beloved, but the nearest auto shop is far away. Will you do it? How much do you want for it? asked Thomas. Of course, I'll help. Give me a little time, and as for payment, I won't take anything from you. People need to help each other as much as they can, the young man smiled. The matter was handled skillfully by the vagabond, and soon a new tire was in place of the damaged one. Thomas was satisfied. He liked the guy's coordinated work, and an insane thought came to the unfaithful husband's mind. What's your name? Thomas asked the vagabond. Oscar, the young man replied, dusting off his pants from the road dust. I'm Thomas, said the wealthy man, deciding not to mention his last name. You're a smart guy. Do you drink? How do you feel about women? He continued to probe. Your questions are strange, Oscar said, surprised. As if you want to hire me or something. Yeah, maybe I do, the businessman replied arrogantly. Do you like to read? How do you treat women? I respect women, I love books, and I don't befriend the green snake, Oscar replied in one go and laughed. Is that answer okay with you? Perfectly, Thomas smirked. All right then, I need a caregiver for my wife. She's in a coma right now. The attending physician says she needs someone to stay in the room with her for a long time, read and talk to her, well, just interact, as if she were normal. Why don't you want to do it yourself? Oscar wondered. Doesn't it bother you that another man will be spending time with your wife? Thomas replied sharply. Not at all, Oscar replied bluntly. All right then, are you willing to take on the task? I'll pay, of course. I'm not sure, Oscar replied. Why don't you want to help her yourself? And also, how will I explain my presence in your wife's room? What will the doctors say? Oh, I don't have time to sit with her. I have a business, explained Thomas. And the doctors? They've never seen me. They don't care who their patient's husband is, as long as money keeps coming into their account. The clinic is private. What kind of gift do you want to buy her, if it's not a secret? Oscar asked. A new book, so she can read? Thomas suggested. A gift? That's not for her, Thomas replied shortly. So, are you in agreement? Oscar was shocked by such shameless treatment of his wife and mentally felt sorry for the poor woman. Listen, he said. I agree. I feel sorry for your wife. By the way, what's her name? And I owe a lot of money to the household appliance store. I work there as a loader, unloading goods. I grabbed a box with a TV. It slipped and ended up breaking. They said if I don't pay off the debt in two months, they'll report me to the police for theft. They'll pin all sorts of fraudulent schemes on me, and I won't be able to prove anything. I don't have money for a lawyer anyway. That's how I ended up in this mess. Well, how about I pay off your debt for you, Thomas suggested, relieved that he got off so cheaply. And in return, you'll sit with my wife. Her name is Monica. Okay, agreed, said Oscar. Monica. Beautiful name. Thomas rubbed his hands joyfully. But I need to go to work, Oscar realized. You still need to work off the debt for the TV. I'm like a powerless slave there. I'm afraid they might start charging me interest. These people are serious. Well, we'll go there now, and I'll sort everything out with them. Thomas suggested. But first, we should tidy you up a bit. Let's stop by a couple of places. 
Oscar had never been to upscale clothing stores before. So, finding himself among decent men's suits and elite leather shoes, he felt lost. And when an arrogant consultant approached them, casting a disdainful glance at the poorly dressed young man, Oscar panicked and wanted to leave. However, nothing here bothered Thomas. He was in his element. Ignoring the salesman's surprise and his disdainful looks towards Oscar, he sternly said, All right, we need to dress up this young man here. And please, make it quick. And you can keep your smirks to yourself. No one pays you for them, right? Although Oscar was grateful to Thomas for the help, he was now worried about the new debt, which was growing like a snowball. The items here cost an exorbitant amount of money. How will I pay for all this clothing, he fretted. Socks cost as much as a whole coat in a regular store. Don't worry, it's all included in your salary, Thomas replied. Besides, I'll deposit some amount into your account. And I think you won't be a vagabond anymore. You need to match my status. No one should doubt the substitution. And also, did you see the face of that consultant? Yeah, arrogant guy, off-putting, replied Oscar. You should behave the same way with the medical staff, lectured Thomas. But I don't know how to do that. No worries, you'll learn, the businessman grinned. But with your wife, of course, you should be delicate and tactful. Although Monica won't understand you, she's in a coma. As far as I know... People in comas hear everything, so I'll try my best, Oscar assured eagerly. You won't regret hiring me. Half an hour later, the former vagabond looked like a city dandy from the cover of a glossy magazine. The fashionable gray suit fit his slender figure perfectly, and the patent leather shoes gleamed with novelty and luxury. Counting out the cash, Thomas paid for the purchases with a haughty flick of his hand, while Oscar watched how he behaved and noted the details. The performance was about to begin. First, the conspirators went to the appliance store where the young man had accidentally gotten fined. When the owner saw the expensive foreign car parked right by the entrance, he ran out to greet the wealthy customers himself. He immediately began extolling the virtues of his products. Don't bother, Thomas said curtly. We've come to pay off your debt for the TV and the interest that's accrued on it. Oscar, pay the man. The guy got out of the car with a tight bundle of banknotes and handed them to the former store owner, who recognized his former loader. Suddenly, he shrank back, afraid for his own skin. He mumbled something unintelligible, trying to justify himself and bowing, until brave Thomas and Oscar got into the car and drove off to their business. I bet he's now thinking that you're a discreet millionaire who decided to live among ordinary people, Thomas laughed. I think he's probably going over in his mind whether he was too rude to you and whether that rudeness will come back to haunt him in the future. I felt kind of awkward, admitted Oscar. He was so pathetic, just like I was back then when that darn TV broke. Take care of yourself, muttered his mentor and stepped on the gas. Thomas was already expected at the private clinic. No one noticed the difference. So, Oscar put his newly acquired knowledge into practice and pretended to be an important person. The chief physician of the clinic, Victor, came out to meet the esteemed guest. We're glad to see you, Thomas, he fawned over the wealthy man. Your wife is in stable condition. She recently had a massage and vitamin therapy to maintain her tone. She really needs your presence to recover quickly and get back on her feet. Hello, trying to maintain a sense of superiority, replied Oscar. Where is the ward? He was escorted straight to Monica's bedside and left alone with his wife. When Oscar saw the young woman in her helpless state, so fragile, so pale, he felt sorry for her. Not only because she was once an influential businesswoman, full of strength, 
but also because her own husband didn't even want to be by her side during Monica's difficult times. All those tubes and medical devices in the room scared him a bit, but he pulled himself together. After all, the person lying in front of him was much more frightening and burdensome. Good afternoon, Monica, Oscar began, addressing the patient. I know you must hear me. I'm sorry for barging into your sleep like this. Your husband, Thomas, asked me to do this. He's busy right now, dealing with business to support your company. That's why I came disguised as your husband. Just don't tell anyone, please, and Oscar smiled awkwardly. He thought he saw Monica's eyelashes flutter. With great enthusiasm, he started a conversation with the poor woman, imagining her as an ordinary interlocutor who responded to him. I have a new suit, Oscar said, not knowing how to start the conversation. It's a shame you can't see it. And it costs a lot of money. I thought those were not prices, but phone numbers. And what about those salespeople? I was even afraid of them. And your husband is so brave, the way he started commanding them. I wish I could be like that. Oscar settled into a comfortable chair and, fiddling with the edge of his jacket, trying to overcome his natural shyness, looked around. Everything in the room was equipped with the latest technology. The furniture was new. On the table were fresh flowers, a vase of fruit, and a small refrigerator with water and snacks. May I have an apple? He asked Monica. I'm really hungry. I haven't had anything since morning. And without waiting for an answer, he took a bite of the red juicy apple. Oh, it's sweet! Oscar exclaimed. And the neighbors have sour green ones. Sometimes I help them with their garden. Get well soon. There's so much delicious food here. Out of habit, Oscar waited for a response from his interlocutor, but then realized that there wouldn't be one. He felt terribly sorry for poor Monica, who, by the will of fate, found herself confined to her bed. What kind of books do you like? Oscar asked, looking at the patient. I'm not very wealthy, but I have a large library. All these books were passed on to me by friends and acquaintances. It's strange, but people don't like reading nowadays. I'll bring a couple of books tomorrow, and we'll start. Well, I'll be reading, and you'll be listening. Agreed? But for now, we'll make do with what we have. Oscar went out into the corridor and headed to the duty nurse. Miss, do you happen to have any light reading books? He asked her. Check the lounge. There's a small library there. Oscar went to the luxuriously furnished lounge, which looked more like the lobby of a foreign hotel. In the bookshelves made of redwood, untouched and neatly arranged books were displayed. His eyes caught a completely new edition of Pride and Prejudice. Oscar immediately thought, Yes, this book will suit Monica. It's tailored for women, and it was written by a woman, just right. The book marked the beginning of a new stage in Monica and Oscar's acquaintance. Reading took up a significant portion of his time spent with the patient. The medical staff was impressed by the husband's attitude towards his wife. He's been sitting there for five hours already, the nurses whispered. You can tell he loves her very much, he's worried. But why didn't he come to her earlier? Well, he was probably busy, others replied. After all, he's a serious businessman. While for Oscar, the time spent in the hospital with Monica flew by quickly, for her husband Thomas, it dragged on unbearably long. So, how's your wife doing? Still alive? Veronica asked discontentedly. When will our ordeal end? With the money you spent on her care in this clinic, you could have bought an apartment. The doctors say Monica's condition is stable. There have even been some improvements. Whatever, Thomas tiredly replied to his mistress's attacks. 
Besides, my man is with her, reporting on all the changes in her health. Doctors don't give guarantees for a full recovery. Miracles don't happen. So, you don't have to worry. Soon, all the company's assets will be mine. In two weeks, the board of directors will meet precisely on this matter. And I'll take over management and then sell everything. Oh, how wonderful, exclaimed Veronica. You're so decisive. I adore you. And in a burst of emotion, she hugged Thomas. These two didn't even imagine that something unusual would happen somewhere in the city. Oscar fell in love with Monica. Or with the Sleeping Beauty, as he now began to call her. This feeling set off a chain of incredible events, thanks to the miracle doctor named Nestor. It was he who developed a special system for the rehabilitation of comatose patients and shared it with colleagues from other clinics. So one day, when Oscar was reading another romantic novel to Monica, he suddenly wanted to hug her. Carefully leaning over, he pressed his lips to the young woman's cheek. Oh, sorry, it just happened. I won't do it again, Oscar apologized in a tone of regret and went back to his chair, which was opposite Monica's bed. It's okay, a quiet female voice suddenly sounded. I'm glad. Why apologize? Oscar froze and turned around. Monica lay there, turning her face towards him. Her eyes squinted. Apparently, even the soft light pouring from the lampshade hurt her eyes out of habit. Thomas, come here. What are you doing? She said. I'm so glad you've been with me all this time. Tears streamed from Monica's eyes. I've been lying like this for so long, you won't believe it. But I heard every word you said, but I couldn't shout to you. It was like I was at the bottom of the sea, and you were somewhere above, talking, talking. And I was reaching out for your voice. You saved me. Shaking with fear of being exposed, but hoping that Monica still couldn't see well, Oscar approached and reached out his hand to her. She took his fingers and stroked them, looking directly at Oscar, and then suddenly screamed. Who are you? Where's Thomas? What's going on? I'm glad you've come out of the coma, Oscar said softly. I'm here on behalf of your husband. He didn't have time to be here himself, you know, business, partners, and all that stuff you have in your business. So, I spent time with you, reading, talking, monitoring your condition. And you kissed me too, was that you? asked the bewildered Monica. I'm sorry, Oscar lowered his head. Call the doctor for me, Monica said indignantly. But it wasn't necessary. Nestor was already running down the corridor, having received signals from the sensors. He was smiling. His most difficult patient had finally awakened. My dear, I'm so glad, he exclaimed. I've been waiting for your awakening. How are you feeling? We'll conduct some tests and take some samples now. Is there anything bothering you? I'm concerned about why there's a stranger in my room, she said. How did you let this happen? What stranger? This one? Dear, what are you talking about? The doctor was surprised. It's your husband, Thomas. Don't you recognize him? He's not my husband, Monica replied wearily. He's some guy. He read me books, talked to me all the time, sat here next to me. She paused. The realization of what was happening dawned on her. Oscar was the savior, the voice she had been reaching for from her terrible dream. Monica looked at the trembling boy with emotion. He was so helpless and harmless that all the anger immediately subsided. Okay, forget it, she suggested. Oscar, you can go. I have no complaints against you or the doctor. The boy took his jacket and headed for the exit. He looked back to see Monica again, who was already talking to the doctor. He would miss her, he knew for sure. 
Meanwhile, Thomas and Veronica were enjoying a delicious dinner at an expensive restaurant. When are you going to propose to me? The girl suddenly asked. But first, we need to get divorced, seriously. You're getting ahead of yourself. Thomas was surprised at his mistress's audacity. And I wasn't planning on getting married again just yet. My wife is dying, in case you didn't know. You're talking nonsense. What will people say? You had to spoil such a wonderful evening. I even turned off my phone for you. I don't want to be distracted by trivial matters. So turn it off from the machine. Veronica demanded again and stomped her foot under the table. How much longer? My youth is passing. Be patient. I think everything will happen on its own soon. Thomas tried to calm down his angry lover. By the way, I have a gift for you. Look. And he pulled out a flat leather box from his jacket pocket. When Veronica opened the case, her eyes lit up with greedy excitement. It was the bracelet she had been dreaming of day and night. Now she would have something to boast about to her friends, just like the other gold diggers and kept women like herself. Meanwhile, the clinic had called Thomas several times already. But he didn't hear and didn't suspect that Monica had not only awakened and somehow talked, but had already had dinner with oatmeal cooked in water without salt, which seemed tastier to her than any exquisite French dessert. Monica was gaining strength and sincerely wondered why her husband wasn't with her at such a momentous moment. Monica is here to see you, the pretty nurse announced. Send her in, she replied shortly, finally looking forward to seeing her husband, whom she had already missed. Moreover, she couldn't wait to find out how things were going with the company. And her surprise was great when she saw Oscar standing before her with flowers and a bag full of fruits and homemade food. You again, Monica said, feeling that she wasn't angry at the young man at all, and even on the contrary, it was as if she was pleased to see him. Huh, he nodded. I came to apologize. Can I? Well, go ahead then, Monica replied, suppressing a laugh. Yes, she definitely liked her savior. Such a kind guy with an honest look. People like him were rare. Monica knew that well because she was one of them. I'm sorry for pretending to be your husband, Oscar began quietly. It just so happened that I ended up here because of him. But I'll never regret it because I liked you. And I'm just a wanderer. I don't even have my own home. I don't remember my parents. Lived in an orphanage from which I escaped because of the cruelty of the director. Then I got involved with the wrong crowd and almost ended up in jail out of stupidity. So, if you want me to leave, I'll go and never bother you again. Oscar exhaled heavily, as if he had just run a marathon. Monica smiled. Okay, I forgive you. After all, you saved me. If it weren't for your cultural get-togethers, who knows how much longer I would have spent vegetating. And I couldn't care less about your past. What's done is done. And I love flowers. And your bag smells so delicious, my mouth is watering. I'm famished. Let's see what delicious things you've brought. Let's have breakfast. Oh, I could really go for some chicken soup right now. And the happy Oscar began to unpack his gifts. And then two completely different people, who had become friends in the face of adversity, started to have breakfast and discuss everything under the sun, unaware of how time was flying by. So, a bond had formed between Monica and Oscar, one that wasn't easy to break. Meanwhile, the doctor, who quietly entered the room to examine the patient, did not interfere with such an idyllic scene. He was glad to see Monica's condition improving so rapidly with the help of the guest. When Oscar left, Monica felt empty. She realized she was getting attached to this person. I have good news for you. Nestor finally entered for an examination. Monica, 
I can't believe my eyes, but your indicators are excellent. After a short rehabilitation, we can discharge you. I am incredibly happy about this. And I would even call it a miracle, but it was mostly thanks to your visitor. I've never seen such dedication in anyone. Thank you, Dr. Monica rejoiced. She was alone in the room and suddenly felt her loneliness keenly. She wanted to see Oscar again. But before Monica could think about her friend, he showed up in person. I brought chicken soup. Remember, you asked for it, he said, quietly opening the door to the room. She was ecstatic to see her savior, and the soup was very welcome. A young recovering body craved homemade food after a long illness. And again, they had lunch together. They talked a lot, laughed, trying not to remember the terrible trials they had to overcome. Let's call my husband now, Monica suggested. He doesn't even know I've woken up, or he would have been here by now. His phone is off for some reason. Maybe Thomas was on a plane or in negotiations with partners. Well, that might not be the case. He'll come running, the shameless liar, Oscar thought to himself, but said aloud, call him, and I'll step out for a moment, not to disturb you. Finally, Monica managed to reach her husband. When Thomas saw his slightly pale, significantly thinner, but content wife on the video call, he was almost speechless. Pushing away the mistress standing next to him, he stuttered. Monica, darling, what a joy. When did you come to your senses? And why wasn't I informed? I'm coming to you right now, love you, kiss. After quickly ending the call and clutching his chest to calm his fiercely beating heart, Thomas looked at Veronica in alarm. She was angry. I told you we should have acted sooner, but you kept saying let's wait, let's wait. Well, have you waited long enough, fool? Love you, kisses, teased his mistress. Ugh, listening to this makes me sick. What servility? Go and tell her that you don't love her anymore. Let her give up half of the company and the money. You fool. Thomas shouted. In the prenuptial agreement, it clearly states that if one spouse cheats on the other, the injured party automatically gets the entire company and the money in case of divorce. Understand? If Monica finds out you're here with me, she'll file for divorce immediately. And then it's over for me. So sit here and wait for me to return. But Veronica didn't want to be anyone's puppet. That wasn't her style. Left alone, she began to devise a plan to improve her own life. There was no hope left for Thomas, and as a lifelong mistress, the mercenary girl had no intention of continuing in that status. Meanwhile, in the clinic, a real drama was unfolding. Thomas played the role of the loving and happy husband brilliantly. The medical staff had already heard about Monica's husband's wanderings and disapproved of the well-groomed man with flowers who practically ran down the clinic corridor. Thomas carefully pretended not to notice the sidelong glances because his main goal was to regain Monica's trust. My dear. Thomas chirped. How you've delighted me. I always knew everything would be fine and you would recover. I hoped for the best until the end and didn't believe the malicious gossip. Oh, how I love you. Oscar stood aside, feeling disgusted by the flattering speeches of the deceiver. So, he quietly started to move towards the exit. You love me so much that you hired someone to be with me instead of you, Monica laughed. Oscar stopped. He was curious to see how Thomas would respond to his wife. Well, you know what times we live in, Monica, Thomas groveled. Just a moment away, and vultures immediately surround the company. I couldn't risk the entire business of your life. All right, maybe you're right, Monica said. Okay, sit down and tell me, how are things with us? 
but before he could sit on the edge of the bed, Monica said, Oscar, where are you going? I thought you'd stay with us. You're my best friend now, and Thomas is too, right, Thomas? He helped you so much, didn't he? From Thomas's eyes, Oscar read everything that Monica's husband thought about it and replied, No, I'll leave you two alone since you haven't seen each other for so long. Okay, Monica persisted. But I have a proposal for you. Please don't refuse, don't hurt me. We need more help in the mansion. Gardener, carpenter, janitor. What could you work as? People like you will be very needed for us. And then you can find something better, like a job in our office. I'll be happy to. Thank you. Oscar was happy that he would be able to see Monica every day. I can be a gardener, a carpenter, a janitor, I can do it all. Thomas disagreed with his wife's proposal, but he didn't dare to object. His position was too fragile. However, he did send a scorching glance to Oscar, which the enamored gardener didn't notice. A week later, Monica was finally discharged. Her husband and a whole entourage of personal assistants greeted her. Thus, the unfaithful Thomas wanted to divert Monica's attention from himself and avoid uncomfortable questions. When Monica arrived at the gates of her house, she was surprised to see how her beloved garden had transformed. Every bush was trimmed, and rare varieties of roses appeared in the flower beds. Nearby stood Oscar in work overalls, smiling broadly at his employer. She immediately approached him. You've arranged everything so wonderfully here. Thank you, Oscar. Thomas, watching this scene, was beside himself. He really didn't like this upstart. In the evening, Veronica added to Thomas's discontent. Congratulations, you're going to be a father. I'm pregnant, the brazen girl blurted out. What? exclaimed Thomas. This is the last thing I needed. There's no way this can be happening. So, is this how you love me, Kitty? Veronica hissed into the phone. Then blame yourself. I'll give you a month to transfer money to my account so I can buy a house by the sea and live comfortably with our baby. Otherwise, I'll tell your wife everything. Remind me, what does your contract say in this case? When Veronica hung up, Thomas sat with the phone in his hand for a long time. He didn't know what to do until his gaze fell on the family photo of Monica. Adelina. Thomas whispered into the phone. Your daughter was in critical condition. She was just discharged from the hospital. We didn't want to upset you and your father-in-law, so we kept silent. Come over. Monica needs your help. It was done. Thomas knew that his wife's parents would come home tomorrow. And with them, Monica wouldn't be concerned about business or her husband's company shenanigans. And it happened just like that. Adelina burst into tears as soon as she stepped over the threshold. Sweetheart, how could this happen? Your father and I were almost out of our minds. What happened? You've always been so healthy. Thank goodness Thomas told us everything, or we wouldn't have known about your illness. Mom, everything's fine. It all worked out. Her daughter tried to reassure her. We have good doctors. And one person helped me a lot. Literally pulled me back from the brink. And who's that? Her mother asked. I'll introduce you now, Monica smiled. He works for me now. When the parents saw Oscar, they were speechless. They exchanged glances and whispered to each other. He looks so much like our gamekeeper, Monica's mother said. As if he's risen from the dead. That's right, Monica's father exclaimed. I knew that man well. Poachers killed him 25 years ago. His wife was left with little Oscar. So, you're his son then? 
But where's your mother? I don't know. I grew up in an orphanage. Oscar was shocked. He never imagined he would someday find those who knew his family well. My dear boy, Adelina sobbed. Poor orphan. Let's go. I'll feed you with our country food. You used to love my pies. They entered the house. Monica was touched and intrigued by what had happened and looked at Oscar with completely different eyes. And Thomas was already regretting inviting his wife's relatives to his home, thereby bringing the janitor closer to his family. Moreover, Thomas had to pay Veronica for her silence as soon as possible and was frantically searching for a way out of the situation. While Oscar was being fed with country dishes and questioned about his difficult fate, Thomas wandered around the house. He was thinking about where to get such a large sum of money that could satisfy his mistress's insatiable greed. And then his gaze fell on the safe where the company's emergency cash was kept. With trembling hands, Thomas entered the coveted code. The door opened easily. Inside were neat stacks of large bills. After having the contents and carefully closing the door, Thomas called Veronica. Let's meet at the central bank in an hour. I have the money. Veronica didn't keep Thomas waiting. She arrived much earlier. Swiftly stepping out of her car, she smiled sweetly at Thomas and walked briskly towards her money bag. That's what she called her lover. Nothing stopped her from taking the stolen money, not her conscience, not Thomas's stern looks, not even the pregnancy that didn't exist at all. Veronica's scam was as old as the hills, and Thomas was neither the first nor the last to fall for it. Returning home, he cursed his former mistress in his thoughts and pondered how to extricate himself from this dirty story. No one in the house noticed that Thomas had gone somewhere. Everyone was absorbed in getting to know Oscar's life. Thomas took advantage of this. He went into the guest house and slipped a few bills under the mattress where the guy slept. Rubbing his hands together, Thomas slipped out of Oscar's house and inconspicuously joined the group, pretending to be interested in a conversation that didn't interest him at all. The lack of money soon came to light. Monica, wanting to save the company from the consequences of her husband's mismanagement, wanted to inject funds. Thomas, where's the money? She asked him. Did you buy something without my knowledge? We agreed to decide together where to spend large sums. He brazenly lied. We have a new tenant, actually. Maybe Oscar got into the safe. Monica suggested. Well, he doesn't know the code. What are you talking about? Besides, he's not that kind of person. How do you know what kind of person he is? Let's search his things and the guest house while he's away, her husband suggested. Monica doubted that Oscar could steal from her. But Thomas convinced her to check anyway. They went into the guest house together. Everything was tidy there. Thomas rummaged through the cupboard with the sparse belongings of the lodger, but of course, there was nothing there. Then he lifted the mattress from the bed and exclaimed with mock surprise, Oh, look, money. See, Monica, what your gardener is like. And you didn't believe me. What are we going to do? Maybe we should wait for him? Let him explain where this money came from, Monica said, disappointed. I'm just curious, where could he have hidden the rest? What are we waiting for? Let's call the police. Let them sort it out. It's their job, argued the husband. Monica, reluctantly, agreed. But in her heart, she couldn't believe that Oscar, whom she trusted so much and owed her life to, could deceive her. Oscar arrived just as the police car pulled up to the house. What's going on? He asked the homeowners standing at the doorstep, looking at them trustingly. Monica's heart raced at his gaze, as if she wanted to tell him she was wrong. But Thomas knew his wife could forgive the despised Oscar, and he ordered her to go into the house. 
Monica left without looking back. Oscar stayed behind. He didn't resist when they handcuffed him, only looked Thomas straight in the eye, in which there was nothing but lies and greed. So you're saying you didn't take the money, right? The investigator asked Oscar. I didn't take anything, Oscar replied shortly, hanging his head. He was deeply hurt by Monica, who didn't even listen to him. And he regretted a hundred times over that he had once agreed to Thomas's scheme. But the past couldn't be undone. The investigators sent him to a cell hoping he would crack. After all, the words of a simple guy against those of a prominent businessman and respected person in the town didn't carry much weight. Oscar lay down on the cot and pondered. Then sleep overtook him. And at night, in the detention center where the guy was, a thick smoke enveloped him. A terrible fire broke out. Many inmates and their guards perished in that fire. Some prisoners escaped. By morning, the town learned the horrific news. People died a terrible death. Many of them couldn't be identified. Relatives ordered DNA tests. Lists of the deceased were posted on the prison wall. Oscar's name was on them. How can this be? Monica lamented. Oscar died on the same day he was imprisoned. It's all my fault. I didn't even talk to him. What if it wasn't him? There were no signs of the safe being broken into, she said. But it was him. Thomas insisted. But who else could it be? I just want to bury him with dignity, Monica suddenly said. Take care of it. That's my only request, understand? During the day, Monica went to the store to buy a black dress. Choosing a simpler one without embellishments, she involuntarily listened to the conversation of two young women who were clearly renewing their entire wardrobe. You're lucky, Veronica, the redhead admired her friend. You managed to make a fortune with this fool. I'm envious of you, in a good way, of course. Thank you for all these expensive things. I couldn't afford them for anything. You're my only friend, always supporting me and keeping your mouth shut, Veronica condescendingly replied. That's my gratitude. And Thomas will steal from his wife again. They've got money coming out of their ears. The schemer pinned it on the gardener, and the foolish wife believed him. Take this coat too, it'll suit you. Hearing these words, Monica was furious. She realized that the innocent Oscar had died needlessly because of her husband's thief. Moreover, she finally understood why Thomas hated Oscar. He knew too much but remained silent, apparently afraid of upsetting the already weak Monica. And the unfaithful husband took advantage of it. Dropping the dress, she walked past the two young women without saying a word. She decided that Thomas, not Veronica, should answer for everything. Did you steal the money from the safe? Monica asked directly, turning on the voice recorder on her phone. No, of course not. Thomas exclaimed. But your Veronica says otherwise. I know everything. Tell me, or it'll be worse. Monica threatened. And stumbling and mumbling incoherent excuses, Thomas confessed to his betrayal and desire to take over the company, as well as the theft of the money. On the same day, Monica handed the recording to the same investigator who handled Oscar's case, asking not to punish Veronica too harshly. Within an hour, the lovers were brought to the police station. Veronica returned the money right away, though not all of it, settling for a suspended sentence while Thomas ended up in trouble with the law. Monica organized Oscar's funeral herself. A month later, she finally divorced her husband. The company's affairs were back on track, but Monica wasn't happy about it as she longed for Oscar, whom she seemed to have fallen in love with. Go see the fortune teller, her mother advised. She helps people calm down, find out what was, what will be. 
I heard she can communicate with the spirits of the dead. Maybe she can help you ask Oscar for forgiveness. Monica's mother cried, wiping her wet cheeks with a handkerchief. And Monica's father frowned, twirling his mustache and pretending to read the newspaper. In reality, he discreetly wiped away a stingy tear. Monica didn't wait long. The next day, taking the only photo of Oscar, she went to the famous fortune teller. The house was not far from the forest and looked more like a fairy tale cottage than a residential building. But when Monica stepped inside, she was amazed by the beauty of the decor. In the middle of the hall, near the fireplace crackling with logs, a beautiful woman in her fifties sat in an armchair, stroking a black cat. Is guilt following you? The fortune teller immediately asked upon seeing the guest. Yes, it seems I heard a good person. More than that, a loved one. He died because of me. I want to ask Oscar for forgiveness, Monica replied with a trembling voice. Do you have a photo? The psychic asked briefly. When she took the picture, on which the cheerful Oscar smiled, she screamed. Oscar, this is my son. How did you get this photo? This? This is my beloved Oscar. He burned to death while in prison. No, he didn't die. He didn't die, the woman whispered. My son, he's found. He's not far away. I was out of my mind when I left him with the baby near the door of the orphanage. Then I ended up in a psychiatric hospital. And later, my abilities for fortune-telling came to me. But I can't help myself. Monica left Elena's house feeling relieved. She smiled. It seemed there was hope. But she hadn't driven far when a dog ran under her wheels. Are you crazy? Monica shouted. The dog was exhausted and whimpered in pain. Monica had to take her to the vet, who prescribed treatment. Monica couldn't abandon Spot. That's what the new owner named her furry friend. Spot turned out to be kind and seemed to alleviate Monica's emotional pain as she continued her search for her beloved. One day, Monica was walking with Spot in the nearby forest near the lake. The dog was running and chasing birds while Monica sat by the water's edge. Suddenly, she saw a familiar reflection behind her. Monica turned around and screamed in surprise. Standing behind her was Oscar, alive but with burns on his face and hands. Oscar. She threw herself onto the guy's neck. Oscar, you're alive. Forgive me. He smiled, silently embraced her, and said, I forgive you, my love. And then he fainted. Spot barked loudly, calling for help. The news was buzzing in the clinic. A former patient is now treating her savior here. They've switched places, so to speak. Oscar's surgery was successful. And he looked as good as before. Nestor was proud. No wonder such a complex and painstaking job was done on a face mercilessly touched by fire. Soon Oscar was hugging his mom, whom her old friend Adelina had prepared for the meeting in advance. Sweetheart, forgive me, Elena lamented. You've had such a difficult life because of me. Don't worry, mom, I'm just glad you're alive, Oscar whispered, burying his face in her shoulder. I'm not upset, such things happen in life. The others quietly left the room to let the mother and son enjoy their happiness. Bitter. Good advice and love. Happiness to the young echoed from all sides at Oscar and Monica's cheerful wedding. Nestor sat in the place of honor, happy for these worthy young people's respect and family happiness. Oscar, meanwhile, was the happiest person in the world, having found a wife and reunited with his mother after years of wandering and deprivation. Only Monica's father remained serious. He kept guessing whether his daughter and son-in-law would give him a granddaughter or grandson. 
Elena smiled, watching the young couple. She had known everything for a long time, but it was her secret. 